again, welcome back to Cybersecurity in the Ancient World. This is the final episode in this series. When thinking of communication security systems, we often think of computer systems, banks, and secret services like the FBI and CIA. Yet, did you know that the ancient Greeks and Romans knew everything about hiding secrets and securing confidential information too. In this series of 10 videos, we will discuss 10 examples of secret messaging in the Greco-Roman world from the 8th century BCE to the 4th century CE. We will see the Spartans and Caesar going to war. but also cipher codes, love letters, invisible ink, and ultimately, someone who is carrying his own death sentence without knowing. When and why did the Greeks and Romans use secret communication? And what secrets did they hide from their enemies? We will see this and much more in this series. So welcome to cybersecurity in the ancient world. Episode number 10, hiding a very special secret relationship from Ausonius epistles. This is our final episode, episode number 10. Today, we will take another look at invisible ink. Last time we saw that Pliny and Ovid suggested how lovers could communicate with each other. For example, by touching each other briefly when they met. Another possibility was to use invisible ink in love letters to communicate with each other. Hiding secrets was a favorite theme in Ovid's work. In fact, we can find dozens of references to and advice for lovers who were trying to communicate secretly with each other, especially at banquets and at public gatherings like games. In their respective works, Pliny and Ovid had a relationship between a man and a woman in mind. We know this because it is what they discussed themselves. Yet, of course, there were, and still are, other relationships too. For example, between two men or two women. Homosexuality was not a problem in the early periods of Greek and Roman history. In fact, all kinds of relationships and having mistresses was seen as normal. To give but a few examples, at the age of 12, Spartan boys would often enter an institutionalized relationship with a young adult male in Sparta. There is some discussion about the exact nature of this relationship. Plutarch describes it as a form of pederastry and really has an erotic relationship in mind. In this relationship, Plutarch says, the older warrior would engage with promising youths and a long-lasting relationship with an instructive motive. Xenophon, on the other hand, claims that the laws of the Spartan lawgiver Lycurgus strictly prohibited a sexual relationship between a man and a boy. Yet, he also acknowledges that this would have been rather unusual compared to other Greek city-states. A variety of relationships is something we see in the oldest mythological stories. Jupiter, or Zeus, had children with loads of women let us take a look at a few of them. Mars 
the god of war, was the son of Jupiter and his wife Juno, so he was a full god. And here we see Apollo and Diana, children of Jupiter and a goddess Latina. But Jupiter also had relationships with mortal women, like the woman we see here, Alcmena, who gave him Heracles. Heracles was a demigod or a hero, since only his father was a god and his mother was mortal. And what about this one? Manava, the goddess of war and wisdom, suddenly came out of Jupiter's head, even in full armor. So, all kinds of relationships were so common in early Greece and Rome that we even see it in mythology. This changed around the time that Christianity became the most important religion in the Roman Empire in the 4th century CE. Eventually, Christianity even became the official state religion under the Emperor Theodosius in 380 CE, so at the end of the 4th century. The fact that all sorts of relationships were no longer common or allowed in Rome must have been a problem to some people. One of them may have been the poet Ausonius. Ausonius was a Roman poet and teacher of rhetoric from Bourdigala in Aquitaine. This is modern Bordeaux in France. Here he lived from about 310 to 395 CE. For a time, Ausonius was tutor to the future emperor Gratian, who afterwards bestowed consulship on Ausonius. Ausonius wrote a large number of works on a variety of subjects. His best known poems are Mosella, a description of the river Mosul, and Ephemeris, an account of a typical day in his life. Ausonius's many other verses show his concern for family, friends, teachers, a circle of well to do acquaintances, and his own delight in technical handling of meter in poetry. Ausonius also maintained a vivid correspondence with a number of people. Many of his letters have been preserved in the work Epistles. This is the work we will take a look at today. The last point that should be mentioned here is the fact that Ausonius appears to have been a rather late and perhaps not very enthusiastic convert to Christianity. Ausonius' most famous pupil was the poet Paulinus, who later became a Christian and eventually became Bishop of Nola in southern Italy. Paulinus of Nola lived from about 354 to 431 CE. He was born in Bordigala or Bordeaux around 354 CE. As we have seen, Ausonius was born here too. Paulinus came from a notable senatorial family with estates in the Aquitaine province of France, but also in northern Iberia and southern Italy. Paulinus was educated in Bordeaux, where his teacher Ausonius soon became his friend. Later, Paulinus became a poet, a writer and a senator. 
He also attained the ranks of consul around 377 CE and became governor of Campania around 380. At some point, he also married the Spanish lady Theresia of Nola. Following the assassination of the Emperor Gratian and under influence of his wife, Paulinus abandoned his career, was baptized as a Christian, and after Theresia's death, he became Bishop of Nola in Campania. Asonius and Paulinus soon became good friends, and they may have been lovers too. To prevent others from finding out about this relationship, Asonius suggested in letters to Paulinus how they could hide this secret and other secrets from others, since in the early Christian world, this relationship was not allowed. In one of his letters to Paulinus, Asonius wrote that he knew countless codes of the ancients for concealing and unlocking secret messages. And he added that both men should use these methods to communicate with each other. This would have been a perfect way to hide the secret of their relationship. However, despite the claim to know countless forms of secret communication from earlier periods, Asonius only directly refers to a scant handful of the various methods that the Greeks and Romans before him used. For example, we find a discussion of the Spartan use of the scutala that we have already seen in episode number 4. We also find Ovid's suggestion to use milk as invisible ink, as discussed in episode number 9. In Asoni's description of the invisible ink, we clearly hear Ovid. Asonius, like Ovid, suggests the use of fresh milk that would become completely invisible when it had dried. Only when rubbing ashes onto the paper, the text would become visible again. It is significant that the language Asonius uses to characterize his secret communication clearly emphasizes hidden rather than coded and encrypted messaging. He refers to concealing or hiding and revealing or exposing the messages rather than encrypting them. Tellingly, Asonius describes such secret communications as hidden rather than as encrypted. Asonius therefore highlights not only the scant variety of options for clandestine communication with which he was familiar, but also his focus on steganographic over cryptographic methods. It may be that Asonius reference to knowing countless codes refers to other communication between Asonius and Paulinus that is now lost to us. Maybe they wrote to each other in invisible ink or by using the scutala. This is in fact plausible with a relationship that had to be kept secret. We've come to the conclusion for the last time. In a previous episode, we have looked into invisible ink. According to Pliny the Elder and Ovid, lovers, a man and a woman, could use invisible ink to hide their relationships from fathers and rivals. Today, in this final episode, we have seen a special relationship, one between two men in the early Christian world of the 4th century CE. Hiding the relationship between Asonius and Paulinus was of the utmost importance, with both men being Christians and Paulinus even becoming a bishop in the end. So if there was an actual love relationship, this had to be kept a secret. Perhaps we can say that love and war come together in this example. 
We cannot know with certainty whether Asinius and Paulinus were in fact lovers. But a situation like this one could, and still can, of course, occur in a number of situations. Think about it. Two men, two women, or even other people in a relationship fighting for their relationship in a world where they could not or cannot be together. It is something we can still see nowadays. Thank you again for watching. What do you think of this episode? Do you want to know more about Ozonius? Or would you like to share anything else? Then please feel free to contact me for any comments, suggestions, etc. This was the final episode in the series. Please stay in touch and look out for more work on secret communication in the ancient world in coming months and years. If you're interested in articles related to these videos, then take a look at the PlankSip website. If you want to attend a course or want to have a chat, then please contact me. I'd love to discuss any ideas. Please also share this series of videos and articles in any way you like. In that way, more people can become familiar with secret communication in the ancient world. Thank you for watching again and for following this series. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.